tidings for which I call upon the house and the nation. As the Second World War entered its third year, Adolf Hitler and his Axis allies continued their advance into new and unconquered terrain. In 1942, the vast armies of the Third Reich were plunging ever deeper into Russia, battling the Red Army in the war-torn streets of Stalingrad, while further south they had reached the icy mountains of the Caucasus. North Africa, German and Italian troops had crossed the border into Egypt and were edging closer to the oil fields of the Middle East. In the Far East, Hitler's Japanese allies had extended their influence far beyond the confines of their tiny island empire and commanded great tracts of land and ocean that stretched from Southeast Asia to the remote islands of the Pacific. Millions of people were to suffer unimaginable horrors as the Axis powers encircled the globe, casting a reign of fear and terror across every nation they occupied. But for those who continued to struggle beneath the shadow of the new order, by the autumn of 1942, hope lay on the horizon. The strength of the Allies was growing, and with the Soviet Union, America and Great Britain now united, the balance of power was beginning to shift. By November, the Allies would finally be ready to launch their invasion of North Africa. And while the Eighth Army beat the enemy back out of Egypt, German and Italian forces in the Western Desert would soon face an attack on two fronts. In the meantime, the Soviet soldiers fighting the Great Patriotic War in Russia were ready to launch their counter-offensive at Stalingrad, and as the city fell beneath the icy grip of winter, the German Sixth Army would soon be trapped with no hope of escape. From the frozen plains of the Soviet Union to the darkest jungles of the Pacific, the fight against the Axis was gaining momentum, and at last, the tides of war were slowly but surely beginning to turn in the Allies' favour. No one could have foreseen, however, the speed at which Japan would create its new empire, and by 1942, the eastern enemy had claimed territory, stretched out from the western border of Burma at the gates of India, to the freezing Aleutian Islands near Alaska, that conquered islands as far south as New Guinea, and the Solomon Islands in the South Pacific. While the conquests mounted by 1942, some felt that more should be done in the Pacific theatre of war, and American naval commanders were particularly keen that the attack on Pearl should be avenged. 
determined to strike back at the Japanese, Admiral Ernest King insisted that an offensive should be launched on the island of Guadalcanal, which was part of the Solomon Islands to the northeast of Australia. The Japanese had begun building an airfield here, and their presence in the area was posing a considerable threat to Australian ports. King was concerned that the sea routes between Australia and America would soon be severed, and with troops already arriving in the Pacific, this could have grave consequences for the possibility of an Allied counterattack. Despite the directive that gave the European war zone priority, the Joint Chiefs of Staff in Washington eventually agreed to King's campaign. By August 7, 1942, the first U.S. amphibious landing of the Pacific War had taken place, marking the beginning of America's change from defensive operations to offensive action. The battles in the dark and humid jungles of the Solomon Islands would nevertheless be long and bitter, with more men losing their lives to deadly diseases than to the enemy. Out at sea, in the meantime, fierce naval battles would continue to rage, causing heavy losses to both sides. On October 26, the carrier USS Hornet, which had launched the first attack on the Japanese mainland during the Doolittle raids in April, was hit during the Battle of Santa Cruz Islands would be a major loss for the American fleet, but little could be done to save the carrier, which suffered heavy bomb and torpedo damage. Nevertheless, the Americans had an important advantage, having seized the airfield on Guadalcanal from the Japanese during the first days of battle. Henderson Airfield was now being turned into a sizable airbase and would pose a considerable threat to any attempts by the enemy to ship fresh troops to the island. As the Americans continued their grueling battle for supremacy, the Japanese prisoners mounted. By December, it was evident that King's campaign in the Solomon Islands had been a success. While the enemy retreated further back towards the west coast of Guadalcanal, it was decided that the weary US Marines could finally step down and let the army divisions take over. By the end of the winter, in February 1943, Guadalcanal would be secure, and the Americans would be ready for their next step in the Pacific War. Meanwhile, over 4,000 miles to the north of the Solomon Islands, US soldiers were faced with a very different challenge. The Aleutian Islands, which lay off the coast of Alaska in the North Pacific, had been invaded by the Japanese in June 1942, placing the enemy uncomfortably close to Canada and the west coast of America. With the risk of aerial attacks on the American mainland becoming a real possibility, it was decided to send a small number of troops to occupy the island of Adak just a few weeks after the invasion of Guadalcanal. From here, it was hoped that strikes could be launched on Japanese forces based on the islands of Kiska and Atu. The bitterly cold weather and freezing terrain would pose as much of a problem to the US soldiers in the Aleutians as the heat and disease-ridden jungles of the Solomons had posed to US Marines. From thick fog and high winds to plunging temperatures and icy conditions, the Americans based on a DAC would have much to contend with. Nevertheless, their determination to defeat the Japanese kept them battling through the worst of the weather, and they would soon be ready to launch their first attacks on the enemy. 
The key to victory in the Aleutians would be air power, so building a suitable airfield to ensure that the bombardment of Japanese bases could begin as soon as possible had been top on the list of priorities. Although conditions were not always ideal for flying, once the airbase was ready for use, American pilots would begin to brave the bitter weather and inflict as much damage as they could on Japanese forces in the area. The battle to oust the enemy would nevertheless take some time, and it would be 1943 before American troops could venture onto Kiska and Atu to ensure the Aleutians were cleared of the invaders. While events in the Pacific focused primarily on the invasion of Guadalcanal, the war in the Aleutians would become known as the Forgotten War. The men who fought here would still play an important part in the global conflict, however, and many lives would be lost as they battled to protect the American mainland and the Pacific sea routes from the threat of attack. Both the campaigns in the Aleutians and Guadalcanal, nonetheless, remained secondary to the more pressing issue of defeating Nazi Germany. By 1942, hundreds of thousands of Soviet soldiers were being killed on the battlefields of Russia, and the urgency of opening up a second front in Europe was growing by the day. There had been much debate amongst Allied commanders about where to launch their attack, Back in 1941, Winston Churchill and Franklin D. Roosevelt had discussed the possibility of an ambitious cross-channel invasion from Britain into occupied France. The venture was widely supported by American commanders, but the British were more reticent, wary of the strength of the Nazis in France. The armistice signed between France and Germany in 1940 had placed northern and western France, including the entire Atlantic coastline, beneath the control of Hitler's troops, and sending British and newly trained American forces to face the battle-hardy Nazis was considered a suicide mission. In August 1942, such fears had been justified when a small-scale raid launched on Dieppe in northern France had disastrous results. The port was fiercely defended by the Germans, and of the 6,000 Canadians and British troops who had taken part in the landings, over 4,000 were killed, wounded or missing by the end of the campaign. The tragedy made it evident that the Nazis would not give up an inch of the territory they had conquered without a tough fight. Although the experiences of Dieppe would contribute to better preparations for the eventual invasion of France, it was clear that more time was needed before a large-scale attack could be launched, and soon an alternative mission began to gain greater popularity. As well as France itself, the Nazis had control of French colonies in Africa. Ports in Algeria and Tunisia ensured that crucial supplies for Italian and German troops were arriving unhindered across the Mediterranean Sea to North Africa, and this was posing a considerable problem for British and Commonwealth troops protecting Egypt. Despite all attempts to stall the enemy advance by June 30th, Axis troops led by General Erwin Rommel had crossed the Libyan border and had reached El Alamein just 60 miles from Alexandria. There was now a real danger that the Nazis would seize the Suez Canal, which was vitally important to the balance of power in the Second World War. The Suez connected the Mediterranean to the Red Sea, rich oil fields of the Middle East, and if seized by Hitler, it could have devastating consequences for the Allied war effort. 
While the situation deteriorated in Africa, it was proposed that rather than a cross-channel invasion into France, an invasion of North Africa should be undertaken. The plan was to seize key ports and airfields in Morocco and Algeria in a simultaneous attack on Casablanca, Oran and Algiers. Allied troops would then advance into Tunisia and seize the port of Tunis, which would prove an important move in restricting Axis supply lines. British naval commanders felt that seizing these ports would be a vital step in gaining control of the Mediterranean, which would in turn be crucial if there was going to be any hope of pushing the enemy back out of occupied Europe. It was hoped that after the invasion of North Africa, the Allies would then be able to advance on the soft underbelly of Europe and invade Italy. American commanders were initially reluctant to agree to the invasion of North Africa, fearing that the British wanted to postpone a large-scale invasion of northern France indefinitely. But President Roosevelt had formed a close friendship with Winston Churchill and supported the move. General Eisenhower was selected to coordinate the invasion, which was codenamed Operation Torch, and in the summer of 1942, he arrived in London to commence preparations for the attack. Meanwhile, in North Africa, the fight to stall the Nazi advance continued. General Bernard Law Montgomery, otherwise known as Monty, had taken over the command of the 8th Army in Egypt in August 1942 and was determined that Rommel and his troops would advance no further than El Alamein. The 8th Army had fiercely defended their position in the Battle of Alam El Halfa at the end of August and now formed a defensive line which stretched from the coast to the impassable Quattara Depression and this would ensure that the Germans and Italians were held at bay for the time being. There was little doubt that Rommel's troops would soon attack again, however, and Montgomery's focus in the early autumn of 1942 was on preparations for a dramatic counterattack, which would expel the Axis from Egypt and drive them back into Libya. Vast quantities of weapons and ammunition were stockpiled to give Montgomery's troops superior firepower. Additional tanks arrived from America, and while more forces arrived to join the 8th Army, Montgomery soon had almost 200,000 men at his disposal. In the meantime, Allied planes were doing all they could to destroy the Axis supply lines. Forces from Malta intercepted ships in the Mediterranean, while the Desert Air Force kept up a relentless campaign against Axis supply vessels bombarding Libyan ports close to the border with Egypt. This meant that most of Rommel's supplies had to be shipped to Benghazi and Tripoli, which were much further west and an enormous distance from El Alamein. Soon the flow of supplies crossing the Mediterranean to the Axis armies had fallen to a dismal level and Rommel began to realise that the war in Africa would not be won without more air support. The planes of the German Luftwaffe were, however, occupied in the battles of the Soviet Union, leaving Allied air power unchallenged in the Western Desert. By October 1942, less than half of Rommel's supplies were getting through, and to make matters worse, the commander's health had begun to fail. He decided to take sick leave and departed for Germany to recover from his illness, leaving his troops to the command of General Jörg Stumm. But the departure of Rommel couldn't have come at a worse time because Montgomery was about to launch his counterattack. 
months of meticulous planning were finally over, and on October 23rd, the Allied troops were bracing themselves for their greatest battle yet. In the silence of the desert, all took heed of Monty's simple message that each and every officer and man should enter the battle with the determination to see it through, to fight and kill, and finally to win. At 9.40 in the evening, the onslaught began, with the largest artillery bombardment since the First World War. 900 artillery guns fired at the Axis lines for 15 minutes, so that the ground was soon shaking with the sheer power of the attack. As the shells pounded Rommel's defences, the infantry advanced and were soon clearing the way for the armoured divisions. The battle would continue for 14 days and nights, and although Rommel made his way back to North Africa to help stall the Allied advance, by November 2nd he knew he was beaten. Despite orders from Hitler to fight to the last, the Nazi commander started his retreat two days later. Back in Britain, the news of Montgomery's victory at El Alamein was to be rejoiced across the nation. For the first time since the beginning of the war, church bells rang out across the country to celebrate. No one was more relieved by the news than the Prime Minister, whose popularity had begun to suffer as the Allies were defeated in battles from Dunkirk in France to Singapore and the Far East. The news of Montgomery's victory came not a moment too soon. While Rommel was beaten out of Egypt, faith was restored in Churchill, who was finally able to boast of an Allied success. Speaking to the House of Commons in early November, he announced, This is not the end, it is not even the beginning of the end, but it is, perhaps, the end of the beginning. Churchill had no doubt that the Battle of El Alamein marked an important turning point in the Second World War, and many years later he would write, Before Alamein, we never had a victory. After Alamein, we never had a defeat. The British finally had good reason to celebrate, but many difficult battles still lay ahead, and Operation Torch, the invasion of North Africa, would prove to be a diplomatic minefield long before British and American troops had the opportunity to land in Algeria and Morocco. For the campaign to succeed, it was important to persuade the Vichy French forces in North Africa to collaborate with the Allies, and Roosevelt was concerned that British involvement in the invasion could jeopardise the entire campaign. Although France and Great Britain had fought together in the First World War and were allied at the beginning of the Second World War, when Paris fell to the Nazis in 1940, the friendship between the two countries became strained, to say the least. The French government, led by Paul Reynaud, had tried to escape the advancing Nazis after the French capital was invaded, relocating a number of times until reaching Bordeaux in southwestern France. But some politicians urged for an end to hostilities, and despite Reynaud's objections, by June 22nd, an armistice was signed between the French and Adolf Hitler. Reynaud resigned was replaced by 84-year-old Marshal Patan, who set up a new government in Vichy. The Vichy regime was granted full diplomatic recognition by America, who hoped to use gentle persuasion to draw the Vichy French back to the Allied side. But Great Britain took a different stance. The collaboration of the French with Nazi Germany presented many risks to the country, and there were fears that the French fleet, which was one of the most powerful in the world, would soon be controlled by the Nazis. The repercussions of this would be catastrophic for Great Britain, which was already struggling to survive as the Nazi U-boats tightened their stranglehold on the Atlantic. To recap, 
Churchill, who had been Prime Minister for less than two months, ordered that the French Navy should either join forces with the British Royal Navy or be neutralised in some way to prevent the ships from falling into German or Italian hands. There were already French vessels in British ports, but these were swiftly boarded, but the most powerful concentration of French warships was at the port of Morel Kabia in French Algeria, and it was this squadron which was Churchill's greatest concern. Despite assurances from Admiral Darlan, the Minister of the French Navy, that there was no danger of the Germans seizing the ships in North Africa, the British Prime Minister was determined to eliminate any possible risk to Britain's security. Churchill made one of the most controversial decisions of his career when he ordered that the French fleet be attacked unless it sailed from its base in Algeria to Allied waters. After negotiations failed, the British opened fire on July 3, 1940. There were many who condemned Churchill's decision the admiral who had been ordered to make the attack said that it was the biggest political blunder of modern times. But while politicians chastised the Prime Minister, the attack had proved to the world that the British would put up a fierce fight to the threat of the Nazis, no matter what the cost. In 1942, however, the events of the summer of 1940 posed a problem to the planned attack on Vichy French territory in North Africa. Roosevelt felt that the French would react better to American troops and suggested that all landing forces should be US troops or Marines. The British, who were keen on encircling the remainder of Rommel's troops, were not to be left out, however, and it was finally decided that while the attack on Casablanca in Morocco and Oran in Algeria would be launched by purely American forces, a combination of British and American forces would invade Algiers. The British troops in the meantime were instructed to sew the American flag to their uniforms in the hope that this would appease the French. President Roosevelt also made many other moves to ensure that the Vichy French forces, which far outnumbered the Allied units, would collaborate with the invasion plans. He wrote a personal letter to Marshal Patan, urging him to support the Allies. He even tried to win over the Arab population in North Africa by commissioning a proclamation stating that the American holy warriors had arrived. Pray for our success in battle and help us, and God will help us both, was part of this unusual message, but it's unclear whether it had much impact on the local population. In the meantime, Roosevelt had sent a diplomat by the name of Robert Murphy to Algiers as his personal representative in North Africa. Murphy had the task of contacting all potentially friendly political elements in Tunisia, Algeria and Morocco and was assigned the task of finding a French figurehead for the attack. Murphy soon became convinced that General Henri Girau, who had recently gained fame after escaping from a Nazi prison, was the man for the job. Girau had been held captive by the Nazis for two years, and although he was a supporter of Vichy France, he refused to collaborate with the Germans, a fact that boded well for the Allies. The alternative for the French command in North Africa was General Charles de Gaulle, who had been based in London since the Nazis had occupied France. De Gaulle was considered the leader of the Free French, but Roosevelt felt that if there was to be any hope of winning over Vichy French commanders, Girau would be the better alternative. For the time being, de Gaulle was to be kept in the dark concerning all operations, although he would later become an important presence in the Allied effort against Germany. While the delicate political situation was negotiated, hundreds of Allied ships began heading towards North Africa. The Central and Eastern Task Forces left the British Isles to head for Algeria, 
while the Western Naval Task Force of 102 ships and over 24,000 American troops left the United States to cross the U-boat infested waters of the Atlantic. Their destination was French Morocco, and virtually all the men aboard were going into action for the first time. Just a few months earlier, they had been working as clerks, lawyers, salesmen and garage mechanics, but soon they would face the overwhelming demands of battle. When the ships were several days out at sea, they were briefed on where they would land and taught basic phrases of the language spoken there. Instruction in French was supplemented with lessons in elementary Arabic. And while some learned languages, infantry men would work endlessly on preparing the weapons on which their lives might depend. African army will contest our landing, but all resistance, by whomever offered, must be destroyed. However, when any of the French soldiers seek to surrender, you will accept it and treat them with the respect due a brave opponent and future ally. Remember, the French are not Nazis or Japs. All three task forces involved in the invasion were proceeding with the utmost secrecy, and although there were many concerns that U-boats would attack, German command didn't appreciate the significance of the convoys and the threat they posed to North Africa. In fact, some commanders believed that the ships were supply convoys heading for Malta. But although the U-boats failed to detect the Allied threat, there were other dangers the invasion forces had to contend with. Stormy weather made for rough seas around the Atlantic coast near Casablanca. It was decided that the Western Task Force should be diverted to Gibraltar, where the other ships were congregating. The Allied island base, which lay between Spain and North Africa, was where General Eisenhower had his headquarters buried deep beneath the base of the rock. But the ships preparing for the invasion weren't the only newcomers in Gibraltar. On the eve of the invasion, General Girau was smuggled to the base by submarine. Girau believed he would be commanding the invasion, and there were moments of confusion while Eisenhower explained the mission through his interpreter. Eventually, Girau agreed to be a spectator and would be ready to step in later as administrator of French North Africa. By the early hours of November 8th, the ships had sailed to their positions in preparation for the three-pronged attack on North Africa, and the landing forces were launched from their motherships. The Eastern Task Force was split into three groups, two heading for beaches to the west of Algiers and one to the east. There was practically no French opposition here, and some French generals even greeted the American forces. In the meantime, 500 American paratroopers had been flown in from the British Isles to aid the attack on Oran. Not all reached their target south of the city, however, and the Central Attack Force was left to deal with the opposition alone. 
after a naval engagement in Oran Harbor, the troops started ashore in the early morning of November 8th, with one combat group landing to the east of the city and another to the west. Their aim was to then converge and capture the city by a double envelopment. Some units faced resistance, but before long, all fighting had ceased and the French surrendered to the Allied troops. The second part of the three-pronged attack had been successfully accomplished, but the third, landing to the north and south of Casablanca, would be a different story. A coup to overthrow the pro-Vichy commander in Casablanca had failed, and French defences were now in wait for the Eastern Task Force. The Americans were fired on by elements of the French fleet, and a fierce naval battle ensued off the coast of French Morocco. Although four of the French ships were eventually sunk, in the meantime, the troops landing ashore were encountering heavy opposition. But while the battling continued, there was a turn of events that would have a profound effect on the future of the North African campaign. When the Eastern Task Force had entered Algiers, it had been discovered that the Vichy French commander, Admiral Darlan, was in the city on a private visit. With the opportunity to deal with a senior Vichy representative who had greater authority than Giraud, Eisenhower began negotiating with the Vichy commander and offered him the chance to stay in control of French forces if he joined the Allies. Keeping the Vichy commander would mean the Vichy regime, with its Nazi laws and concentration camps, would be maintained, and for many, this was simply unacceptable. De Gaulle, who had now learned of events in North Africa, was furious, and General Giraud was not enthusiastic about working alongside Darlan. As news of Eisenhower's collaboration with the Vichy commander spread overseas, there was much confusion in America about where the loyalties of the Allied commanders lay, and many were dismayed by the negotiations being made with Vichy France. But the fact remained that without the collaboration of Darlan and a permanent peace agreement between the Allies and France, many more lives would be lost during the battle for North Africa. Hundreds of French planes and pilots stood poised for an attack on the Allied troops now moving towards Tunisia, and it was vital that Darlan's cooperation was obtained so that the rest of the campaign could succeed. Finally, on November 10th, after coming to an agreement with Eisenhower, Darlan ordered a ceasefire and the French troops laid down their arms. The fighting ended in Casablanca, and Allied troops could now continue their march towards Tunis, but the consequences for Darlan would be grave. Marshal Catan immediately ordered his dismissal from the French Navy, and Hitler, furious with the news that Darlan had collaborated with the Allies, ordered troops to march into unoccupied France on November the 11th. However, the Nazi leaders' invasion of Vichy France only hardened the resolve of the French to support the Allies, and their troops soon joined the British and American units heading for Tunisia. While the Allied tanks rolled further east, 1,200 miles away, the 8th Army were making swift progress from the opposite direction, having driven the Axis out of Egypt. 
Montgomery's troops continued to seize strategic ports along the Libyan coastline. It was hoped that Rommel and his troops would soon be encircled by the two Allied armies. As the battle for North Africa continued, Adolf Hitler feared that southern Europe would soon be under threat, and he ordered thousands of troops and tanks to be sent to Tunisia to fight back the Allied attack. Meanwhile, General Kenneth Anderson from Great Britain was leading the Allied race for Tunis with the First Army. His troops were made up of American and British soldiers from the Eastern Attack Force, as well as French soldiers, and their aim was to reach the Tunisian capital before Axis reinforcements arrived. By November 22nd, Anderson's troops were ready to launch a major assault on Tunis, but the weather began to hinder their advance. Within a week, torrential December rains had transformed the arid landscape into a quagmire, and the Allies faced a slow and difficult struggle across the unstable terrain. While mud now became as much of an enemy to the First Army as the troops of the Axis, the Allies arrived too late to seize Tunis. Nazi reinforcements had already consolidated their positions and began launching their counterattack, and it was clear that the fight for North Africa was not going to be as swift as initially hoped. The inexperienced American soldiers would face a difficult fight before they could seize Tunisia. While the 8th Army made steady progress from the east, General Eisenhower was convinced that the Axis would soon lose their foothold in the area. Back in Great Britain, Winston Churchill was jubilant and celebrated the events of the past month in a speech to the British population. Now, uh, we have... Uh just passed through the month of November, usually a month of fogs and gloom, but on the whole, a month I've liked a good deal better than some other months we've seen during the course of this present unpleasantness. And so I say to you, let us go forward together and put these grave matters to the proof The invasion of North Africa had achieved what the Allied leaders had hoped for, and while combat continued, some of the pressure was now taken off the Soviet soldiers battling around Stalingrad. In early November, Hitler had boasted that Stalingrad is in our hands, but while attention was focused on events in North Africa, he seemed unaware that the Russian general Yorgi Tsukov had begun amassing an enormous force to the north of the city in preparation for a crushing counterattack. By November 16th, the first snows of winter had swept across the Russian battlefields, and fate was on the side of the Soviet soldiers. The Volga River became a frozen bridge, and the troops of the Red Army could now cross over into the battle zone. Within days, they were ready for their dramatic counterattack, and Russian artillery opened a gigantic enveloping maneuver with one army to the north of the Germans and another to the south. Half a million Russian soldiers and 15,000 tanks advanced in vast columns, while across the steppes, a band of 50,000 Cossacks stormed across the winter landscape. Under the onslaught, the German line began to bend. Then the Russians made a breach, smashing through the 6th Romanian Corps on November 20th. Zhukov's aim was for the two Russian forces to meet far southwest of Stalingrad, 
in order to encircle the entire German 6th Army and to cut its supply lines. Within four days, he had achieved his goal as the two spearheads of the Russian pincer movement met 100 kilometers west of Stalingrad. 250,000 German troops were now trapped inside the city. To prevent the 6th Army from breaking the encirclement, the Russians began creating a corridor to a width of over 100 miles, which would separate the army from the rest of the German military. Hundreds of tanks were soon moved into the area, along with 60 divisions of Soviet troops. But instead of urging the 6th Army to escape while they still could, Adolf Hitler ordered their commander, General Friedrich Paulus, to remain in position and to hold the city at all costs. On November 23rd, Hitler declared that Stalingrad was a fortress to be defended to the last. Hermann Göring, Hitler's deputy and head of the Luftwaffe, had assured the Nazi leader that his planes could drop supplies to the 6th Army, but providing for such a vast number of troops was beyond the capabilities of the German Air Force. Appalling weather conditions, technical failures and Soviet anti-aircraft fire all limited the abilities of the Luftwaffe, and while all attempts were made to get supplies to the soldiers in Stalingrad, before long those trapped inside the city began to run out of fuel, ammunition and, most importantly, food. As Soviet forces consolidated their positions around Stalingrad, battling to shrink the pocket of Axis soldiers, the situation for the thousands of Germans within became desperate. It was increasingly evident that the Luftwaffe could not carry out their mission to supply the 6th Army, and plans were made for a rescue attempt. The operation, codenamed Operation Winter Storm, aimed to break through the encirclement and relieve the trapped German forces. On December 12th, the German 4th Panzer Army, under the command of General von Manstein, began their relief effort and initially took the Red Army by surprise. They made large gains on the first day, and the spearhead forces successfully defeated the Soviet counterattacks. But by December 13th, the advance had slowed considerably, and three days later, the Russians launched their second offensive. As resistance and casualties increased, Manstein appealed to Hitler and to General Paulus to begin the 6th Army's breakout operation, but both refused. The decision would prove fatal for the hundreds of thousands of men still inside Stalingrad. Although the 4th Panzer Army continued to attempt to open a corridor to the 6th Army between December the 18th and 19th, two days before Christmas, Manstein was forced to call off the assault. By Christmas Eve, the 4th Panzer Army began to withdraw to its starting position, and the 6th Army were left to their bitter fate. The final stages of Nazi Germany's attempt to conquer the Soviet Union had failed. By January, the soldiers still left alive in Stalingrad would have no option but to surrender to the enemy. 
Around the world, the armies of the Axis were fighting desperate battles, and it would only be a matter of time before the Allies achieved their final victory. But while many had real cause to celebrate during the Christmas of 1942, the Allied commanders had little time to pause in their continued drive to defeat the enemy. The fight for Tunisia would continue far into the new year, and it would be spring before the Allies could claim their prize and march into Tunis, and after Tunis there would still be another two years of fighting before the Nazis surrendered. Meanwhile, in the Pacific, the struggle to vanquish the Japanese would be long and bitter, as the Americans fought some of the bloodiest battles of the war to wrench one island after another from their control. Although the tides of war had turned, there were still countless battles to be fought across the globe, and the fight for victory was far from over.